guess we should start. So, uh, start. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, doing modern data science with VEX, a new approach to uh, data frames and pipelines. So let me introduce uh, the team behind uh, VEX, VEX.io. Um, um, so my name is Maarten Bredders. I'm a former astrophysicist, uh, freelancer, consultant, mainly working on uh, tooling around data science. Um, I'm also a core Jupyter widget developer. Um, and I do a lot of that with, uh, together with Constack. Later today, I'll give a talk about uh, Voila for dashboarding. Founder of Vex.io and the uh, principal author of uh, Vex. I'm here uh, together with uh, Jovan Veljanovski, also a former astrophysicist. That's how we know each other. Uh, he's now a senior data scientist at uh, Zebia Labs, where he builds uh, uh, machine learning models on top of uh, DevOps uh, pipelines. And co-founder of Vex.io. Um, you can find us online. And we also work together with Jonathan Alexander, so uh, for uh, uh, like a direction to go for, for uh, basically um, um, the direction facts uh, should go. Uh, and we work together with Maria Buikhuizen on uh, basically the dashboarding front end uh, uh, part of this. So uh, people are coming in. So the uh, the outline is um, I'm going to start with well, what is facts. Um, why does FEX actually exist? Uh, what makes it unique? Um, so I'll talk a bit about it, like how the data frame works, uh, how it manages data and state. Uh, the expression system is really important in this. And uh, we're going to do a live demo from a notebook. Should always work right. Uh, and I may show some extra. So let's take a look at the, uh, this, uh, uh, I would say, famous image of the uh, pie fish landscape. Uh, where some people say like all of these are like visualization libraries in Python and it's an unorganized mess and it's like how do I choose? Well, it's similar to phones, like you have the choice of stress but it's like uh, we probably don't want to have like one mobile phone, we want to have some choice. Maybe it's too much but at least we have choice. There's nothing we cannot do in the Python ecosystem uh, uh, in uh, the area of visualization. So what about data frames? Well, there are not like so many data frames yet. That may change. Uh, of course, the most famous one in uh, the Python ecosystem is Pandas. Built on top of that is DAS DataFrame. So DAS was introduced uh, the talk before. Uh, and using DAS and Pandas, they built like a uh, DAS DataFrame. Um, using Ray, there's also a uh, version called Modin. Uh, I don't know much about it, but it's worth mentioning a, simil a similar approach of reusing Pandas. SFrame by Turi. Um, also, a, um, a works with uh, like larger data sets. There's QDF. We heard a little bit about this in the talk before. Uh, that works on, your, on uh, NVIDIA cards. Uh, Koalas uh, by Databricks. And today we're going to talk about uh, FEX. Um, so maybe you're like worried, like oh, all these data frames, like oh, we need to make like memory copies, etc. Like, um, but I think. Um, if we kind of speak the same data, we won't have that issue, so we can just like share the data, and that's what the Apache Arrow project is uh, solving. So we don't have to worry about that. It's still work in progress, but uh, we're getting there. So what is FEX? So it's a data frame library, uh, at least FEX core. It's split up in multiple libraries, uh, similar to Pandas. And on top of that, to make it like not like one big project, there are like smaller libraries such as FEX HDF5, HDF5 support, error support, some visualization, a server for having a remote data frame, so you can have data sitting somewhere in the cloud, or the data frame sitting in the cloud. Uh, today, Jovan will show uh, some uh, the machine learning integration, just pip or conda installable. Uh, and you can choose like FEX, which is like kind of a meta package. We'll install everything, or you can choose what to install. So actually, why does it exist? So, um, like, why can't you use any of the uh, the others? So uh, um, what makes uh, uh, FEX kind of unique is it's really memory efficient due to the expression system. And I hope today that will become clear. Um, also, we'll demonstrate that you get free pipelines, like machine learning pipelines. And the um, expression system also allowed, allow us to do just-in-time compilation. So we can use Numba, Python, or um, the uh, QPy actually to make it run on the uh, GPU. 
Fex is using HDF5, trying to follow the arrow spec, and together with the memory mapping, you can open a 1.2 terabyte file on your laptop instantly, like I'll, sh I'll show you later. Um, kind of the features here, like we're trying to postpone the moment when you need a cluster, because uh, I mean, it's great if you have a cluster if you need it, but it's even better if you don't need a cluster. And um, it's just simpler to just work on your laptop. You just open it and work. Um, so this laptop, it can handle over like one billion rows. Um, we're accelerating like uh, things like string processing uh, quite a lot. And, uh, um, and the goal is kind of to like save your time. And in business, that means money, uh, but also like energy. Like you don't need to spin up a cluster. You just like import and you're done. So I want to demonstrate a little bit like, or explain a little bit how the data frame works internally. So let's represent the data frame by a, like a dictionary where we have data. So we have uh, X and Y and we have a state. So now we do an operation on the data frame. We make a new data frame and we say give us, uh, we filter it by saying uh, Y should be smaller than 10. So instead of making a copy of the data, it references the same data doesn't make any copy, and it remembers what the filter was. If you add a new column, so I'm going to add a new column, z, x plus y times 10, uh, if you do this, in fact, what it will do, it will add a virtual column. So it will not compute what you need to, it will actually compute it on the fly if, you, uh, if it needs to, but it remembers this expression. So now the, uh, the dangerous part of uh, doing a live demo. But, uh, so this is my lucky slide, it always works after this. So let's, uh, let's see if it works. Uh, just doing some imports. And let's take a look at what I have on, this, uh, on the hard drive here. So today we're gonna work with this 108 gigabytes of uh, data, which is the New York Taxi data set from this year period. But they want to emphasize like this data set, which is an astronomical data set, 1.2 terabyte. Um, so that will probably take a well to open, so let me open it. So maybe it went too fast, let's like do it again. So it actually opens this data set instantly, this 1.7 billion row data set because it's just doing memory mapping. And when I'm displaying it, it will actually read only the parts that you're accessing. Uh, so today we're gonna use the uh, New York Taxi data set. Um, so let me open it and actually uh, the last minute change, we, uh, we have S3 support. So if you have a data frame uh, or a data set living on S3, it will actually stream in what it needs. We, um, we already like downloaded, so it's all like cached on disk already. Um, but it's useful for sharing notebooks. You don't have to change the uh, like file path. And you see that the, uh, so the New York Taxi data set includes like pickup day times, pickup location, trip distance, etc. And um, so Jovan is gonna do some machine learning. So what I'm gonna do is split it and test and uh, train. And we're gonna work on the train part. Um, so kind of the first thing to do is to uh, run the scribe to see what's in the, uh, data for, uh, in the data. But that takes a while, it's 100 uh, gigabytes. So uh, um, yeah, I hear it spinning, so that's good. It's doing work. So why don't we um, just open the data frame again because it's, uh, it's memory mapped. It's actually practically free to do this again. So we, we open it again. And so the last columns here are the um, tip amount and total amount. So what I'm interested in is like what in New York is a, is a uh, representative, like what's a good uh, tip percentage? So let's say tip amount divided by uh, total amount. And this is, gives you an expression. So it doesn't cost any memory, otherwise it would have cost like eight uh, gigs of RAM. Um, so we have the, so I see 13, 16%, but I want to compute something with it. Like, let's add it as a column. Tip percentage. So we now added a new column, which is again, not using any memory. And with this column, we can do a computation as if it was a normal column. So tip percentage, we calculate the mean. 
So let's show you how much I have to spend on a, uh, like a, a typical tip. So I have to tip an infinite amount. Uh, I don't have that amount of money. So uh, that's probably division by zero. So we should filter this data frame. And we say uh, total amount should be larger than zero. So this part gives a new data frame. But instead of making a 100 gigabyte copy, it only adds this filter and computes this filter on the go. And actually, you can see that it, uh, um, it's only a 7%. Uh, so it's 10%, tip percentage should be great. So I think by now, the describe, yeah, describe ran. And I'm handing the floor over to uh, Jova. Thanks, Martin. So Martin already discussed, uh, showed you the basics concept of, of X, and this all sounds great. But I'm a data scientist, so I really care about how this thing works in practice because I need to, well, solve a problem, satisfy my business case and my bosses. So I really, really, really care about uh, well, how I can use to solve a problem. So in the next uh, like 10 minutes or so, uh, I would like us together to solve a problem together, which is, uh, let's say, learn something about uh, well, being a taxi driver or operating a taxi company. So this uh, data set that we're using has over a billion rows, as Martin said, and it only took, you can see here, uh, on this particular laptop, a minute and a half, to calculate all these high-level statistics. But this is a data the described method very similar to Pandas for, I don't know, like 30, well, about 20 columns or so. So it's very efficient because of the out-of-core efficient algorithms of VEX, and everything runs in parallel. So we can uh, start exploring this, this data, maybe uh, do some cleaning at the start. We have a missing value indicator, so we can uh, feel, see which columns we're interested in. So let's say pickup and drop of latitude are interesting for us, and they have some missing values, so we can go ahead and, and apply a filter. This is, uh, only modifies the state, as Martin said, so it's, uh, well, it's very free. Only, it only executes this operation where I actually try to display the data frame, but there is no memory copying done. So here, if I explore the number of passengers, uh, column, I see that the maximum is 255, which seems a little bit high for like a normal car. So let's see if you're a data scientist, you really like this value counts method that Pandas has. And uh, the only difference here is that I'm applying this for a billion columns, billion rows, sorry. And uh, we can see the, the uh, well, the, zero, the result right away. And in fact, this was a bit slow because the first time I'm reading the data into memory, if I do it again, it's super fast for a billion, for over a billion rows. So we see the reasonable number for one, two, three four passengers. There are lots of uh, well, pass, uh, trips with uh, zero passengers, and then the rest seems like spurious results with just uh, one count. So we can filter and say, okay, we want passenger well trips that have less than seven passengers, but also trips that have at least one passengers. So let's apply the filter. Now look, let's look at the distribution of distances. And this is again for well over, well over a billion rows. So we're making a histogram. It takes well five seconds, maybe close to six seconds. We see uh, some negative distances, so they're unphysical. We want to filter them out, out and a really long tail. So let's uh, we also see a big spike around zero. Let's see just the number of uh, trips that have exactly zero distance and like wow something's uh, weird happening. So we want to filter that out. Uh, but I'm also curious about this white tail. So let's see what is the maximum distance. You do it in a very standard like Pandas API kind of way and we see that it's a like big number of miles which is kind of a, well almost half the distance to Mars. So also not physical, probably people don't, don't have enough money to afford such a trip with a taxi. So well, let's uh, choose a more sensible limit. So we see a distribution again let's say up to 20 miles, and we decide to uh, make a filter between zero and uh, 10 miles of distance. So this data set should be really focusing around New York City, but what is really New York City? We had already a lot of outliers. Uh, let's see what, uh, what this means in terms of pickup location. So this plot, it's interactive. We wanna uh, well, interactively choose what New York City is. So we already see this should be New York City, but we're uh, affected by outliers, but if can you see this little blob? So if we zoom in, we kind of see things already appearing to zoom in. So this is uh, what I call an honest demo. Nothing is pre-computed. Everything is done in real time. So all this zooming calculations, the histogram, the 2D histogram is done in real time. So I can start to see something. And there it is. It kind of looks like Manhattan. And we can zoom in more. 
in Manhattan and see like local densities, which corresponds to hotels, bus stops, metros, and so on. Based on this interactive explanation, you can choose like your favorite uh, box of what New York City should be and apply a standard filter uh, like that. So now we can create some new features that may be of interest. Let's say the trip speed, the trip duration, the fare divided by distance, and so on, and apply some extra filters uh, just like we did before. Uh, at no, ex no memory expense whatsoever, just like Martin described, this is all just modifying the state. The data is immutable. We can also create some uh, daytime features. Let's say from the pickup hour, from pickup daytime, we can extract the hour. This is actually built on top of Panda, so it has the same API, or day of the week, month, and so on. And then, which enables us to do plots like this. If we label the pickup hour and pickup day as categorical, we can see which days or hours, well, for which hours and which days we have the most, uh, are most popular for calling a taxi. So if you're a part time taxi driver, you can know when uh, the taxis are more in demand. So now I'm doing a 2D histogram of uh, hour versus, uh, well, day of week in real time for well, 1 billion trips. And we see this plot makes sense in the early hour of the day. Not many trips are happening. After work, or the social part of the days, there are people use more taxis. And the absolute peak is, well, this is uh, Friday, Friday night, around midnight, just before midnight, or just after midnight. So this uh, Sunday here, just after midnight, is basically Saturday night. So you can uh, well, do really nice exploration for a very, well, very cheap in terms of time. Uh, you can also do group buy, very effective group buy. So let's uh, see how, uh, what the data set indicates if we group buy, for example, the pickup hour and we're calculating the mean tip and the mean speed. After this is done, it's gonna, gonna take a few seconds. You can use your favorite uh, plotting library to display the results. In this case, I'm, I really like Seaborn, so I'm using that. So this is how the resulting data frame looks like. When you plot this uh, result, it kind of makes sense. The mean tip amount, uh, people tip the most in the morning. I guess they're happy they got to work on time. Or just uh, well, when they go home in the evening, they're happy they're, well, maybe their date went well or something. And then uh, when do drivers drive the fastest? Also makes sense. Around in the morning, four or five in the, in the morning, not much traffic. They can put the pedal to the metal. And then in the afternoon, when the traffic jam happens, it's, uh, well, not much speed going on there. Uh, since recently, we also support efficient join. So here, just as you would normally do in Pandas, we can join this group by data frame back to the original uh, one over one point something uh, billion rows data frame. And uh, this will only take a few seconds, as you can see. I can see the fan working. So here is, again, the data frame. If I scroll to the end, I see I have a prefix for the ride. Uh, this is basically the mean tip amount, the mean trip speed uh, for the distances. So uh, as Martin said, well, as part of X, we also have a module called VXML, which introduces some machine learning capabilities. So let me uh, tell you something about that. We can just import it. Here I have a function that uh, calculates the arc distance. So this is the distance between two points as the crow flies. Uh, so this is quite expensive function uh, to calculate because there's a lot of cyclotrometry, a lot of algebra. So let's just add a virtual column. Oops, did I not execute something? Oh, I didn't execute this. So let me add a virtual column. So this is a very expensive uh, function. So if I just uh, calculate the sum of all these distances with NumPy, it's gonna take its time because it's after all, I'm doing a sum of like a billion rows. So it's gonna take around 20 seconds or something. I really like this, uh, this progress bar because when you work with really large data set of just arbitrary size, you wanna know kinda, is this gonna take like a minute, two, or is it gonna run forever? Um, so it takes 19 seconds to do a sum. If you happen to have a GPU on board on your laptop, you can, uh, with the help of uh, CUDA, you can utilize your GPU. And now if you do a sum, it's, well, much faster. So this is using the GPU. So we'll add this uh, version of a feature to our data frame. Uh, if you don't happen to have a GPU, for example, in my work I usually use a Mac, you can use uh, just-in-time compiling. We have Numba or PyTran to get this extra, extra boost. And in fact, if you compute some feature uh, later on that uses CUDA, 
well, you can use one feature, you can use both the GPU and the CPU at the same time if you have one feature that you're computing using CUDA and one using, let's say, Python. So now we can simply examine our data frame and we'll see all the features that we added at no memory cost whatsoever. So in this example, uh, machine learning example, I would like to predict the mean duration of uh, taxi trips. So this is kind of where I'm going in. And uh, this is a dense tabular data set, and its anecdotal evidence has put me to believe that uh, models like decision trees or gradient boosting are very efficient for dense tabular data sets, so I'm kind of going in that direction. And um, because I'm uh, deciding uh, that I'm wanting to predict the mean trip distance, I really care about the origin and the destination of the trips. And the Ameri the New York is an American city, and they really build their cities kind of on a grid. So this is the physical motivation of doing a, a PCA, so VEXML actually in, uh, implements a very fast PCA that works out of core, as, long, uh, as well as uh, various other standard preprocessing uh, methods such as standard scaling, robust scaling, uh, various types of categorical encoding and so on. So the contribution between the PCA trans uh, transformation, so actually I'm doing a PCA transformation uh, in real time on the full data set, minus the filtered columns of course, is to make the decision uh, tree boosting splitting faster because as you will see in a moment, it will align the street in sort of a normal uh, way to, where, to, to the direction in which you're doing the splits. Um, so this is actually more expensive because I'm not only uh, doing the PC, but also I'm plotting two plots. So this is the original selection of, of uh, well, of the pickup and drop of longitude, and this is the PCA transformation. So it's trying to more or less align the streets. So now we can ex again look at the, our data frame. These are the columns that we added, the direction, angle, the distance, and so on. And now we can use our favorite estimator that are supported by, uh, by the XML. Basically, uh, all scikit-learn, all estimators that support the scikit-learn API, as long as you have them installed in your system, it can be PIP or, or Conda, VEX doesn't care as long as you it's in the same part in the environment. So in this case, I'm going to use LightGBM. It's quite, quite fast. So I'll just import Light, the LightGBM uh, wrapper and just use, use it as I normally would. I have a parameters file with my favorite parameters, sort of my uh, sensible defaults. And now just to, because the light, we have no control over LightGBM, uh, this is a separately maintained package. I'm going to well, select a subset of the data to train on. And this is going to take uh, a few seconds. And now, the, what is particularly interesting because of the expression system of X, the predictions, I can obtain them in the normal, uh, sort of usual scikit-learn style, where I just do, uh, well, my boosting object is called booster, predict, and get an in-memory array, a numpy array of the predictions that I can then, uh, well, uh, display. Or I can use the transform method, which actually adds a virtual column of the prediction in uh, the data set itself. And the, the, re the reason for this will come uh, clear immediately. So now we did uh, like a simple machine learning example. We can check the performance, even though this is really simple. I didn't do any cross-validation or anything like that. But let's imagine that uh, we're happy with this result. Mean absolute error is around two minutes. Maybe your taxi company is happy with this prediction. So now we like to do this on the test set. But you're wondering, oh, but we did a lot of exploration. This is really cool, but we didn't do any pipeline. So now I have to go back and uh, implement a pipeline, right? Well, not, not really, because everything that I did so far, the cleaning, uh, encoding, I didn't really do any encoding, it's a mainly numerical data set, but dropping an A or filling an A, uh, if you prefer, is only just modifying the state. So all I need to do is, let's say, save the state to disk, and I'm saving the state to this, this uh, list of operations of what I did to my data frame, and let's go to a different notebook where I'll just uh, import VEX, import this, uh, a data set again, just select the test set, let's view the test set, so the test set has the same format, no other uh, well, columns were added. All I need to do is load the state of the previous uh, train uh, file that I filtered and called it trained on, and uh, then if I just display, all the transformation are now being done, and as you can see as I scroll, we have the columns that we defined, they defined, oops, the PCA transformation, including the prediction, all done for you uh, without explicitly uh, creating a pipeline, and then you can, in the standard way, just test the performance. You see that we have more, more columns, 
And the interesting part is like if you want to visualize, because this, this is kind of a computational graph that we're doing behind the scenes, if you really want to visualize, okay, what led to the calculation of this uh, virtual column, that is the prediction, because we did a bunch of operations. With graphics, you can easily visualize the path that your data took, uh, kind of like a neural network style, style way uh, to get to the visualization, to the, to the final prediction. And uh, in fact, the state is just a uh, normal dictionary that you can inspect to make sure that everything makes sense. So I hope this, uh, this is a good example of what VEX does. It, of course, has many more features, but this is like a simple, uh, simple exercise that uh, well, we can show in real time. Thanks, Martin. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, apparently, my lucky slide always works. So uh, let me end with the uh, conclusions. So um, actually, I forgot the additional slide, but we don't have much time. Um, so VEX, uh, I hope we convince you that it's a very fast and memory efficient data frame uh, library. Uh, on this laptop, it can do like over a billion rows in the order of like a terabyte on uh, like this laptop. Um, I hope the concept of using like data and uh, state is clear, like using the virtual columns to save memory and the filters. Uh, because we, everything is like an expression, we can after the fact like do like uh, just-in-time compilation using Numba Python or even execute it on the GPU. And the state, because we have this state, it kind of remembers the pipeline. So the pipeline, in fact, is actually an artifact. You get it for free and it's really easy to deploy. You just put it to a JSON, upload it to a... Uh, uh, machine. And something I didn't talk to, well, we demonstrate S3 support and I uh, didn't have time to go into the uh, remote data frames where a data frame actually sits on a, uh, like a uh, server. So here are the resources uh, for this. Um, so the, uh, our email addresses, uh, website, the, this is the repo, all the materials, so the notebooks you can find at this, uh, at the Facts Talks uh, repo. Um, there are two Medium articles out. We will probably uh, uh, have some more out uh, like later this year. So if you follow us on Twitter or something, uh, you'll probably get notified uh, if you're interested in that. Okay, thank you very much. Are there questions? I can repeat the question if, uh, if there's no mic. Yeah, so the, uh, the question was like, um, um, what happens if you calculate something uh, like twice? If you use it twice, will it be recalculated twice? And the answer is yes. By default, everything is a virtual column. Um, but um, uh, most, at least what we noticed, like most of the, uh, uh, the issues are like uh, IO issues. So computing is mostly, most of the time, uh, uh, like really, uh, 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 it's not so expensive. It's mostly like reading from this that's expensive. It's changing a bit with solid state drives. Um, but you can materialize a column. So if you say like, okay, I have enough memory, I can waste eight, gigab uh, eight gigabytes of uh, memory, I'm gonna materialize this column, turn it into like a, uh, uh, so that it doesn't recompute. That's, uh, that's a decision you have to make. So uh, we're, not do we're trying to save as much memory as possible and you're in control of uh, well, wasting uh, the memory. Question here. Um, so, uh, in some places, Fex is also using Pandas. For instance, we're not making a new CSV reader. So, for instance, um, uh, if, if you have small data, then you can perfectly work with Pandas, no, no problem at all. So, what we sometimes do, for instance, you have like uh, 100 CSV files. You convert them, you read them with Pandas, and then uh, Fex has me uh, like many methods to convert from a Pandas data frame, um, to a fax data frame, and if you like convert it, it tries not to memory copy, uh, or from an arrow table, it can also like make a data frame, and then export that to HDF5, 
then you can like more efficiently work with it. So uh, I think some of these are converted using that uh, this way, right? So we uh, we use pandas for things that we don't want to build, like uh, CSV reading, etc. Yeah, in fact, the, the taxi data comes all in CSVs, so we have to first read in with pandas because pandas does a good job in uh, well, handling the CSVs, and then we export it. You can either export it to Arrow or HDF5, which is memory mappable, and this is where you get the real uh, performance boost because if you have a HDF CSV, you have to read like every time every time you do something, you have to read it on on top. So the performance you really gain if you well either start a project from scratch or you really have like relatively large data to be worth, like if it's already uh, not efficient enough on your memory, on your RAM, then it's uh, worth moving. Otherwise, you can experiment. Of course, yeah. we would like that, but it's not uh, super important. Yeah, or if you like aggregate all your data and you end up with a small data frame, we have a uh, two pandas data frame method, so it converts it to pandas if some library is not compatible with VEX. And we're checking other uh, libraries as well. Like if I just, instead of a pandas data frame, put in a VEX data frame, what happens? Um, so we try to uh, fix those libraries as well to make it all like compatible. Um, so we don't have the full API of pandas and we will never have like something like transpose we will never do because we don't want to create a data frame with like a billion columns um, so it's basically like uh, we're kind of like adding things on demand so we have a uh, like we have a client or something and need something um, then we see like okay what what's there in pandas that to make this possible and we try to mimic the pandas api because people don't want to learn a new api so where we can we try to stay close uh, like argument names try to stay close as well and if there's like a real like issue like we shouldn't do it this way we deviate from it for uh, for reasons uh, but yeah not everything's complete kind of our uh, we limit ourselves to the things that are possible with a billion rows so that's I hope that satisfies the answer a bit. Fresh. Um, yeah. Does this require that each data set is a separate HDF file, or can I read the HDF file that contains multiple groups, and then each group has its data set? So can I access this somehow, or do I have to have each data set as a separate HDF file? Um, so that's a good question because HDF5 is kind of like a wild west, like there's no standard way of store how to store a data fr uh, frame in a uh, um, HDF5 file. Um, so I think the answer is uh, it can be, there can be multiple data sets in one uh, HDF5 file if it follows the layout that VEX uh, requires, but it should be relatively easy to add a new reader uh, if you have a custom format. But it, uh, it, and also the other way around. Like if you have multiple HCF5 files, you read them in, you can concatenate them. And it, again, will not make a memory copy, but it will just like lazily concatenate them on, on the fly. So uh, uh, it doesn't have to be a single file, uh, single data frame mapping. I see a question there. Uh, good question. So the question was like, uh, uh, we showed this arc distance function that like use some NumPy uh, functions and like how complex can it be? Can it like uh, contain everything? So the two answers to this, um, um, one is like what we showed here is you basically call the method with the, uh, with the effects expressions and that's kind of using uh, what is now becoming like the uh, NumPy enhancement protocol 18 that was talked about. It will actually like call VEX to say like, hey, wh what should I do when I call the cosine on an expression? And it, VEX says, well, it should be a new expression. Uh, so that's one way. And that builds a new expression in the, in the, like the expression language of VEX. If there's something in there that does not work, 
like it's it's not mappable to like NumPy or like if statements or like other functions like libraries. You can add a like a, a new function to the expression system, and then uh, uh, Fex considers that as a black box, and it will call your function with chunks of the data. And you can extend this. You can like there's a plugin system for this. To uh, with the decorator, you say, well, I want to add this function that's not in Fex, so it's easily uh, easy to extend. Uh, good, good question. So uh, yes and no. Effects does not do this uh, itself because pandas can already do this. So the uh, what we sometimes do, like if we get requests like this, so we have a effects dot uh, from CSV that just like uh, calls pandas uh, f from CSV and then turns it into a um, uh, effects data frame. Um, but we don't want to like keep doing this. So uh, I think the answer here is if you have a particular way of reading it and you can convert it to a pandas data frame, then you call fax.fromPandasDF and it will convert it to you. You can export it to HCF5 and then work with it efficiently. So what we usually advise is if you have some data sitting in a non-HCF5 system, you just do a batch job and go for lunch, uh, save it to HCF5 and after that you can like open it instantly. Talking about lunch, I think we should uh, <laughs> go for lunch. Uh, thank you very much.